So you got a hole in your heart. We have a cardiologist here to help us with that. That's important. If you, well, first off, if you do have a hole in your heart, leave a comment, share your experience. Welcome to Talking With Docs, I'm Dr. Brad Wayne. I'm Dr. Paul Zalzal. I'm Dr. Michael Hufferton. Okay. A cardiologist here to talk about a hole in the heart. And before we start, did you know the octopus has three hearts? No. I didn't, I didn't no. know that. Wouldn't that be tricky? Imagine being a cardiologist for an octopus. No. Would it be like, you had a heart attack, but we're okay, we got two more to go. Yeah, I don't um, think they need a cardiologist. No, no. Well, they got, got three hearts. Three, they're yeah, redundant. It's fantastic. All right, so we're going to talk about a very interesting thing that can happen to your heart uh, or that you can be born with, and that is to have a hole in the heart. Right, so, so Mike, would you say that there's really three kinds of holes in your heart? So the, the ASD, VSD kind of, the uh, atrial and ventricular septal defects. So those are yep. kinds of holes in your heart. Yep. We're not talking about those today. Nope. We're talking about something called a PFO or a yeah. patent oh. foramen ovale. Can you explain to us, A, what that is, okay. why, why we have them, mm -hmm. and who has them and what it costs? Okay. Start at the beginning. So let's do, so let's do, so, so a patent foramen ovale. Yep. So patent just means open. Yep. And then the foramen ovale is the structure in the heart. So let's do foramen ovale. Okay. Why, why do we even have that? And so all of you had a foramen ovale. Everybody listening had to have one in order to survive in their mother's womb. Right. Um, okay. In utero as a fetus. And so let's, let's do a little bit of fetal anatomy okay. just for, yeah. for a second here to understand this. So, fetus with this. Yeah. So you are a fetus. You're in your mom's womb. Mm -hmm. You're surrounded by fluid, amniotic fluid. You right. can't breathe. Your lungs are not working. Yeah. You don't need to breathe. Right. right? And, uh, and so what happens is that the mom's blood comes in and uh, it's oxygenated. It's the red blood. And it goes into the fetus. It goes into the right side of the system, which would be normally the, the blue blood, the venous system, right? right? And somehow that oxygenated blood has to get from the right side to the left side right. so that the brain is fed, the heart is fed, the kidneys, the organs, everything. Yep. And, and so, normally that goes through the lungs. Normally but when you're floating lungs. around in this hot tub known as a uterus, yep. you don't need lungs. You don't. Right. And so the mechanism is how are we going to get all this good oxygenated blood from the right side to the left side so that the fetus will grow. And so there's a little hole in the heart that trap door. all had a little trap door called the foramen ovale. And it is in the upper chamber of the heart between the right atrium and the left atrium. Okay. And so it's open, there's a little flap, and all the blood kind of whisks through, goes to the other side, and it's fantastic. There's yeah. actually one other communication. There's a communication called the ductus arteriosus, oh, yeah. which if you got actually any of the blood snuck through and got into the lungs, in the lungs, there was a little communication that takes it from there into the aorta, right. saying, okay, let's make sure all this red blood. This right, because you could have blood. a PDA too. Correct. Not a public display yeah. of infection, no. yeah. a patent ductus arteriosus. arteriosus. And so we're I not remember. talking PDAs. No, 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 no PDAs either. Not on this video. So, so that's a mechanism to make sure all this oxygenated blood gets over to the left side. Got so it. fantastic. Okay. So then what happens in the first 24 hours of life? The baby takes a big breath in. The right, the right sided pressures drop, the left sided pressures go up, flap closes. Okay. Okay. So in 75% of us, the flap has closed. Okay. No problem. Okay. So, but that's at least 25% where it's not closed. That's like one in four. That's pretty common. Two billion people Whoa. in Whoa. the world. Leave a comment. You people, a, every one of you yeah, that has one of these, please leave a comment. All two billion, please leave a comment. <laughs> yes. Have yeah. a, you that's have, wild. You have yeah. a patent for Amen Right. Right. So most people have been to concerts or sporting events. So just to get a feel for this, think about sitting on a bench mm -hmm. at a concert or at the sporting event and going, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. You know, that's how many people have a patent frame and over. Right. It's incredibly wow. common. One right. in four. Yeah, one in four. Okay. And, and does everyone have a murmur with that or is it usually? No murmur. murmur. No murmur. No. no. There's such little flow or so they're totally no flow. Essentially normal. Yeah. In the vast majority. Yeah. Okay, so, so, so why are we talking about that? How, how would anyone ever even know? Because we're not doing echocardiograms for these people just out of the blue. No. Why do we end up finding out that someone has one regardless of what it's related to? That's fair. Okay. okay. So we can't hear it. Right. So it doesn't get picked up that way. People often get echocardiograms ordered for some other reason. Right. And so uh, that gets ordered by primary care or somebody else. Pre-op workup. Merge job, pre-op workup. Yeah. And lo and behold, you know, when we do an echocardiogram, and uh, from some of the views, we can see a little bit of flow. It's a color flow that we can see on an echo. Mm -hmm. And it's like, oh, look at that. And in the report, we'll incidentally write at the bottom, patent for amino valley mm -hmm. was noted or right. it was visualized. So an okay. ultrasound of your heart that shows blood kind of going in a pathway that it's not going to do in 75% of the people. Right. Right. And so for us, seeing that, no big deal. We right. see it almost one in four times. 
uh, but for people who get the reports, for some primary care physicians who are kind of less familiar with the subject, this becomes a bit of a concern. Sure. So it becomes a concern that isn't a concern. Right. They say, what do I have to do about this? We're saying like, nothing. Yeah, nothing. Here's what I'm going to say. See our Baker cyst video. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Here's the analogy. Fair well, enough. That's good to know. Thank you. Yeah. Um, that's my pearl of the day. Right. Um, so, but where it becomes clinically relevant is it if you are a young individual, if you're less than the age of 60, right. and if you've had a stroke, right. this becomes a big deal. Right. So the issue ultimately is that if you had blood clots on the right side of your body or in your veins, normally if they got mobile, they would go up towards your heart and they would go to your lungs. They would get stuck in your lungs and potentially cause something called a pulmonary embolism that would have very specific symptoms and signs and investigations would show a positive. However, if you have a hole in your heart that's big enough that allows these clots to go from the right side to the left side of your heart without going in your lungs, it then could theoretically go to your brain and could cause a stroke. Absolutely. So young people that have, it's called a cryptogenic stroke. Is that cryptogenic the term? Cryptogenic stroke. Yeah. 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 So, so that's the issue here. That's, that's the <clears> issue here. If you're here. young with, a, with one that is causing problems. If you're less than the age of 60 right. and you've had a stroke, we're obligated to look really hard for a patent for Aminal Valley. Right. And if you're less than age 60, you've had a stroke and we find a PFO, most of the time we will close it. If we can't find any other good reason why you had that stroke, we will close that PFO. Right, so, so good reasons being like an irregularity in your heart rhythm. Like atrial clots, fibrillation. Right, so you have clots in your heart that yeah. are already on the left side that go to your brain. Right, crazy high, untreated high blood pressure. Right. Um, you know, which was a clear cause, a dissection in an artery, vertebral right. artery, carotid artery. So, or an anatomical or mechanical problem that right. you're on that left side. So there side. are multiple different reasons for having a stroke. But when you've had a cryptogenic stroke, which is just doctor code for we don't know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so when you've had a cryptogenic stroke, you know, then it's, and you then find a PFO, and you're less than the age of 60, you know, it is felt to be probably the hard cause for that at least 50% of the time. See, it's a weird message we're given, because we're saying, yeah, one in four people have this, no big deal. <laughs> I know. Yeah, don't get I know. excited about Wait a minute, you had a stroke? Oh, this is a big deal now. But if it's a very small proportion of mm -hmm. individuals that experience strokes, fortunately, especially have young individuals who experience a stroke is exceedingly... Yeah. Uh, yeah. uncommon. But if is, you're marching around with the PFO right now, you're like, okay, well, why don't you do something before, before I have the stroke. stroke, right? I because, think we'll get to that part. Well, we'd be doing procedures in two billion people. Yeah, right. It was just simple and procedures. it would cause damage, likely in a lot of them. With For risk. Sure. So, so why in that one in four group of people, why is there the small percentage that do have problems? Is it because the size of the hole is bigger? Yeah. Okay. So it's, it's yeah. about anatomy. So absolutely about anatomy. Okay. So a couple things. So yeah. if the hole is, say, a centimeter, Okay. Uh, or, la or larger, it's a good hole. size. And, yeah. and, and you can imagine that's a good size clot that can go through, yeah. a, go through a centimeter, right? right? Yeah. Um, so it, there's that. If, if on echo, we can see that some people, they have a wall called the intraatrial septum between mm -hmm. the left atrium and the right atrium. And if the wall's nice and rigid, a little less risk of stroke. But some people have an aneurysm in that wall. And so it really moves back and forth. Right. So if you have a wiggly wall, yeah. and if you have a hole that's about a centimeter, that's all increasing risk. Okay. There are a couple of other things that we find on the right-hand side. There's some remnants of your embryology. There are things called the eustachian valve and things called the Chiari complex. Other things that sit in that right chamber, not everyone has them, yeah. but if you've had a cryptogenic stroke right. and we see these things and we see a PFO, it's like, all right, this is... The this wiggly is, wall. Yeah, so. wiggly wall. It's like, no, no, this is likely the cause. And that wiggly wall, that's up. diagnosed on the dance floor? On the dance floor. <laughs> Okay, so now, so young person, you've had a stroke, yeah. you've had an echocardiogram. Is it is it um, on your chest or is it transesophageal or how do they how do they, what, start, what's the actual test? So we start on the chest. So echo, so echocardiogram, standard echocardiogram takes about forty five minutes on the surface of the chest. Okay, um, we put an intravenous in. Okay, and uh, so first we look for color, color without right. without doing anything to you, without mucking around with an intravenous. Yeah. We look for color and say, oh, is there flow? Right. And if it's clear that there's flow, it's like okay. Um, ding, we've got that answer. Right. Uh, but even, even truthfully, when we see that, we, we really want to show that there's, there's something shunting across. Right. So you get an intravenous, we have some saline, some yep. salt water, yep. and we agitate it with little micro bubbles. Okay. And we go, okay, one, two, three, let's throw some micro bubbles into the so it's called a bubble study. It's called a bubble mm -hmm. study or yes. agitated saline study. Right. Um, and so the bubbles go in, they go into the right hand side of the chamber. So if I put bubbles into your vein, it should never get to the left heart, right? There should be no holes. It should be consumed by your lungs. It I should think. be just trapped in the lungs. Yes. 
And so we watch and we look in the first few cardiac cycles, if we start seeing bubbles on the left side and left atrium and the left ventricle, we know there's a hole there. Right. Yeah. Okay, wait, so now someone's gonna write, wait a second, I thought when you get an IV, there's a big bubble there. The air embolus. The air embolus. Can't that kill me, Mike? And, and? The answer is no. So what do you tell your family it's members when you see that on so, TV? So you say, unless it's a very large amount of air, yeah. it's actually exceedingly yeah. rare. That is TV medicine. Yeah, yeah. right, it would have to be gigantic. Yeah. Like the, the amount, it's like not even real. Big air embolus. Yeah. Oh, I think it dates back to days when they didn't have bags for their IV. It was like a glass. Yeah. Yeah. And you could end up with air in the glass. Now in the bag, the IV's in a bag, so it just collapses. Right. So you're not going to get any air in it. Right. And, the re and so an echocardiogram is an ultrasound it's device, an ultrasound. right? And that's how you can see flow, and you're b bouncing sound off the red blood cells. That's how you're getting the reflection. And then when you're looking for color, that's flow. That's using the Doppler effect. Yeah. For those of you that remember high school physics, Doppler effect, that's, that's how you're seeing a shift in frequency proportional to the velocity of the, blood vessel, of the, of the red blood cell, and that's how you can tell it's flowing. And then, but the problem is on the left side and the right side, you have red blood cells bouncing the sound. That's why you insert these bubbles right. in the saline. And they're tiny bubbles, but that's enough to reflect the sound waves. So you yeah. can see it on either side. Okay, so so it's a non-invasive test, even with yeah. the saline. It, it's it's very, it's are there risks to the test? Because people are going to go online and someone's going to say, well, yeah, you, you read no it. You could have a stroke. No, 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 for the bubble study. To the trained thoracic echo, there's no risk. Right. For the bubble study, exceedingly rare. Right. Like, yeah. I, you know, They're tiny bubbles. Never seen It's like tiny anything. bubbles in the wine. There's always going to be there's always going to be risk reported in the literature. Of course. But, but practically, practically speaking, there's no risk for an agitated saline injection. Okay. Um, but next step, though, is it, it, if we do find something, yes. or if there's still a question after all of this, and the clinical suspicion is really high, yep. and we still can't find bubbles, and we still think there's probably a hole, oh. and it's a young individual with a stroke, yep. we are going to do the transesophageal version. Okay. We're going to put you to sleep for 10 minutes. We're going to put a tube down your throat. Which is not, don't make that face. It, looks, it sounds fine. uncomfortable. It's not but uncomfortable. You know, are you sedated at all? Yeah, you're sleeping. Okay. You're sleeping. Okay. You're sleeping. okay. And, uh, <laughs> don't make that face. <laughs> he makes faces all the time. Scare the people. Yeah, yeah, you're scaring people. Scare the people. So you, you, you put the tube down. Right. Because the, this gets closer to you. Yeah, heart. the esophagus and the, and the, you know, the atria are two millimeters apart. Right. So you know, the views are fantastic. Right. And then we can get a really good look. Okay. The reason we also do that is because if you have a PFO, we need the measurement from inside. Right, because you know the, the diameter to We want to know how big is this? Right. And is yeah. there a, good, a big enough cuff around it for how we're going to fix this? Okay, so now you have one. You've confirmed it with 100% confidence. Someone's going to say, well, I really don't want surgery. Is there any, any type of medical treatments? Can we talk about medical treatments to deal with stroke prevention, essentially? Yes. So, so drug treatment. Okay. Here so, you go. Okay. So, so typical drug treatment for stroke would be an antiplatelet agent, right. right? So aspirin or clopidogrel, for instance. Right. So those would be pretty standard. Reduce your clot forming ability. Yep. Okay. Those are very common. We have so many patients. Well, yeah. There it, if if there, is, there is evidence for clotting, so as you mentioned, like if you actually happen to have had some clot right. in the periphery, then that's when we're going to be talking about something a little bit more potent, right? Yep. So old days it was more warfarin. Yep. In the newer days, it's the non-warfarin oral anticoagulants, kind of the rivaroxabans the and the yeah, pixabans, the you know, idoxabans, that sort of thing. Um, so there's that. Okay. But uh, but really, if we find a PFO, if you're young, if you had a stroke, we're talking about doing a closure. Okay. And uh, we just finished doing a TAVI uh, yes. discussion. And so this is actually certainly safer than a TAVI. Right. Same kind of idea though. Yeah. Um, it's safer because we're going through the venous system. So on the other side, yeah. the right side. So, so right side. Right. So anytime we go into the venous system rather than the arterial system, it's safer. Okay. Uh, low pressure system. So we fish a small wire yeah. up into the top of the heart. We fish that wire just across the, the, the hole. Yeah. And we can deploy this kind of umbrella that goes across. And it's fantastic. Close it's amazing. It's amazing. I saw the procedure. It's amazing. Yeah. Close the hole. The Close the hole. Okay. So it takes yeah. like half an hour or something like that by the time it's all yep. done. Yeah. And people are typically going home the same day. Uh, yeah. Or next day. Okay. Some some guided restrictions as far as exertion, just common same, sense kind of same stuff. Same thing for you know, take it easy for yeah. you know, a few days. And then is this uh, is this hundred percent successful? Almost. Yeah. Right. It's ninety five percent plus. Okay. Yeah. You've it's, done some. You've done your work beforehand to make sure right. it's successful. Um, you know, you've done that transesophageal echo. Yeah. You make sure there's enough of a rim of tissue so this umbrella is going to get caught. Yep. Uh, the closure device is going to get caught. And, and there's a rare circumstance where there simply isn't enough tissue where, you know, that would be a surgical procedure to go in and sew that up. 
Oh, so is there ever an indication for PFO based on size and no symptoms or no stroke that you would go in to fix? Uh, you found it incidentally, oh, essentially. Yeah, you just so, so you found yeah. in a workup, you did an echo and you found one Got that a was a one. certain size. So, so I'm hedging because, because mostly the answer, if you're using the term PFO, the answer would be no. Mm -hmm. um, but when, when it's actually, originally somebody thinks, oh, you know, that looks like it might be a peat and frame of valley, but it's really big and there's a lot of flow. It's not a peat and frame of valley. It's an atrial it's septal, septal defect. defect. Right, right. And yeah. yes, we do close those, close especially the if the shunting is like more than two to one, yeah. we close those. Right, yeah. right. Wow. Okay, last question about the PFOs, and I know that this is kind of a newer thing. Can they cause other symptoms? So other than a stroke, there's some talk, if you look online, yep. you know, is the PFO a cause of my migraines? Migraines are so common. And PFOs are really common. Yep. Is it possible that these are related? So the jury's out. Right. Uh, and, and certainly I have patients who have incidentally mentioned to me uh, they had a history of migra migraines. They did need a PFO closure oh, and then they or an ASD closure. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, anecdotally, they'll mention, right. you know, I don't have migraines anymore. Right. And so some studies have been done looking right. at PFO closures as migraine therapy. Right. And the, the data is equivocal. Right. We just, you know, we just don't have a good answer. When well, we say it all the time, your, your anecdote is not evidence, unfortunately. So even though it's you and you're like, listen, well, I had this, now I don't have it. Right. That right. alone is not enough to make clinical decisions for everybody. No, you need thousands of people yeah. with good statistical power to, right. in order for us to say this is the right thing so to still do being for everybody. And that would be yeah. a tough study to do. So yeah. we may never have that answer. Yeah, yeah quite possibly. Wow, so that's the PFO. That's Very PFO. cool. Now, two billion of you know what's going on with you. Yeah. Okay. Even if you didn't know, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so almost comment. one of us would have. Yeah. Uh, well, well, we got hands on the other side. Yeah, one one of, of us has not it. it. <laughs> <laughs> got you. That's for right. We're the same. If you like this video, please like it, subscribe to our channel. And remember, you are in charge of your own health. And thanks to Dr. Heverton for joining us and sharing his knowledge with us today. My pleasure. Okay, we'll see you next time.